have to say. First, this is a good time to turn off and put your cell phones and other devices away. Because this forum is not partisan, we ask for no banners, signs, t-shirts, <coughs> or other offers. Thanks for your cooperation. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. We take positions on issues, not candidates. We think that learning about candidates is important, and we're happy to see you this evening. And we're happy to be here with you. There are a couple of things to take away from this forum. Actually, there are four of your counting. We hope it helps you decide on which of the candidates resonate with how you feel about issues. The primary election is on August 2, and we encourage you to vote. The polls are open from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Primary elections are important because the primary will decide which of these candidates will be on the general election ballot, along with Bill and Buster, our Republican, who is running. The deadline for registering to vote in the primary was July 6. Was. The deadline to register to vote in the general election is October 12th for the November election, so there's a little time if you know people who aren't registered. The League encourages all citizens to register and vote. Your teens will be 18 by the time the election can register and vote November 8th. It's a good step to take in becoming an adult. We want to recognize and thank the volunteers who are, this, who are here this evening for the League. I'm Cheryl Barnes and I serve, I'll serve as the moderator. I don't live in District 28. Anitra Steele, who working with the Chamber, organized the forum. Card collectors are Marianne Watson, Carolyn Arnold, card sorters, so we don't ask basically the same or the same question several times, are Polly Kendrick and Dolores Blazer, and our timer is Peg Prendergast. Thank you for your consideration and thank you for coming. Now we're off to a fast paced evening with questions from the audience. We'll have time answers to make sure we can ask a variety of questions and learn about these candidates. And candidates, we ask that you respect the audience by staying within your time. If you have a question, please write it down clearly on the cards being distributed. We may combine questions if they sound similar, so don't be alarmed if I don't ask your exact question. So ask questions in random order after the candidates introduce themselves. We're pretty strict with the timing, so please watch the timing panels and we pay. You'll have a minute to respond to any questions. At the end of each candidate, we'll have two minutes to wrap up to, to share your concluding remarks. I please do it across the very end. Thanks again for your participation. So we'll stop with Jim.
in a fine community, a community that has trusted me in helping their, their kids become better athletes and better students. I am a Democrat by choice, not by convenience. My committee, I am, my commitment to the Democratic values spans decades, not weeks. The Democratic Party has led the way in providing justice for all and every person since the days of Harry Truman and John F. K. The short answer of why I'm running is to protect and promote the interests of our community and protect our school funding. Unfunded mandates, unfunded formula, keep the uneducated students. <clears throat> Well, first I want to thank the audience, the Lincoln and voters, Raytown Chamber, everybody that hosts this event. It's really great that so many people are out here to learn the issues, learn about the candidates, and make a valid choice. Um, a little bit about me, my name is Josh Green. I am uh, 27 years old. I know I may look younger, but I am 27. I married you. Um, I've served on this board of Alder for three years. I sit right over there. I'm also the chair of the Finance Committee, vice chair of the Legislative Committee, and I also am the co-chair of the Chamber of Commerce and Government Relations Committee with Madeline right over there. Um, I got into this because we need strong representation in Raytown that is energetic and that is very creative and finds out of the, or, excuse me, outside of the box solutions. For too long uh, in the Missouri legislature, we've seen that a Republican supermajority when in order to get anything done in this district as a Democrat, you have to be able to work across the aisle. And the way to do that is not only to be able to find ways and compromises with the other party, but also to be creative and find, like I said, outside-of-the-box solutions. Um, a little bit more about me. I've always advocated, or, or excuse me, I've always viewed myself as, simply put, not only an advocate for this community, but an advocate of the United States Constitution. I think that too many people forsake the United States and the Missouri Constitution for political convenience instead of upholding those values which when we get elected as we're sworn to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Grisek? I'm Diane Grisek. I've been a resident of this area since the 80s. I'm actually a resident um, born in Kansas City. I am a small business owner now, but I started out my life as a federal employee taking the civil service exam. Then I did 20 years ECPL working on various programming projects from <coughs> maintenance, materials management, um, health care, uh, health uh, desk systems and the like. And um, that was a union shop, by the way. All the clerical, all the way up to the power plants. Now I am a small business owner, independent business owner, you might say. I am the editor and publisher at Raytown Brooking Eagle that I started three years ago, and I also sell on Goldwyn Parks around the world. I'm a shipper off of 83rd Street. So I am involved because I think it's time for a woman to get into the house and uh, clean up. So um, I've been watching my customers. They are crying out with, um, they're losing their pensions. There's a lot of issues facing our working families. They're getting crushed. Tax uh, cuts are not helping us. It's, we need our schools and our universities fully funded. <coughs> the tuition is killing our students. And um, that's why I'm in here. There's a lot of issues at stake. And a lot of our people don't really know, realize just city is some of our problems. What's going on there? Thank you. And it sound, looks like, and sounds like we have our sound. So you can. Microphone's a little bit closer. That'd be super. Okay, Mr. Really. Make sure I have the right one here. My name is Pat Really. I am a lifelong resident of this district. Cape Springs Park was my backyard growing up as a kid. I moved to that house with my parents when I was born in 1955. My wife and I both graduated from Raytown South in 1973. All four of our children have graduated from Raytown schools, and I now have six grandchildren in the Raytown School District. For a ter couple of terms, I served on the uh, Raytown Board of Aldermen, attended MML meetings, I was chair of the Finance Committee, chair of the Legislative Committee, and served as mayor pro tem. Three issues stand out in my mind as far as this district is concerned. Number one is the foundation formula for funding school district. Number two is ethics reform in Jefferson City. And number three is what a friend of mine who unfortunately isn't here tonight refers to as 
to the silver tsunami that this state is about to face. That particular item is the influx and the growth of the senior community, not only in the city of Ray Town, but in the state of Missouri. We have not planned for this. We need to plan for this. Those three issues are very important to me. One of the items that I mentioned was the full funding of the school district, or full funding of the foundation formula. In the 2014 estimate, the citizens or the students of Ray Town were unfunded approximately $900 per student. That affects my grandchildren and our children in the district now. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and the Raytown Chamber of Commerce for having this forum, and you citizens for showing your interest in uh, your local and state government. My name is Bill Van Busker. I'm a lifetime Missouri resident, a 42-year resident of Raytown. I've been married for 52 years to my wife, Mary Jane, who's back here and retired from Hallmark Cards after having given them over 40 years of service. My wife and I are members of a local church. I'm a member of the Raytown Chamber of Commerce, the Raytown Historical Society, and a volunteer with the Red Cross as well as other organizations. I was a Raytown Reserve Police Officer for many years. I'm currently serving my eighth year as a Raytown Alderman and have served on numerous committees and boards in the city government as well as Mayor Pro Tem, and I'm currently the chair of the Legislative Committee. I want to be your servant. Yes, you heard that correctly. I want to serve the people of the 28th Legislative District in the state of Missouri as your representative. I'll apply the same conservative values, hard work ethics, sound principles, and character qualities that I've consistently displayed while serving as an alderman. My motivation for seeking this office is to serve I have no other agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll start with the questions, and uh, our first person is Mr. Barnes, and it uh, looks like it's a tough crowd here, folks. Uh, would you support a ban on assault weapons? And what is your position on open carry without permit? Well, you have to start out with me on a hot topic like that. <laughs> Missouri. 
Each and every person that comes in and buys a gun at Bass Pro must pass a criminal background check. If they don't pass that check, they don't get a gun. I am for concealed carry classes and learning how to use that as a tool. Hunters should have the right to own their guns for upland game, deer hunting, the sport that they love. As far as the AR-15 or the uh, assault rifle question, I am for a limited magazine. Right now you can go in and buy magazines of 15, 20, 30, 35, 45, 50 rounds and run those through in a matter of seconds. If we limit those clip sales to say 10 pieces of ammo at a time, we'll have a little less problem I think on the streets and folks will still be able to enjoy their sport. Thank you, Mr. Van Buster. Thank you. You know, as a boy, I, I grew up in a rural community and came up here in 64, but we had guns and uh, never knew anyone to shoot anyone else or want to shoot anyone else. I, I got my first gun, I think, when I was about 12 or 13. It was taught responsibility. Uh, went hunting with it. Um, I believe in our Second Amendment rights. You know, we have a, what we have is a heart problem with people, not a gun problem. Um, you know, there was an attack in France just recently, or one of the European countries, with a uh, with a truck. It was a tool used, just like a gun is used against people. They use knives. Today, there was an attack with knives. I believe in our right to protect ourselves, our families. And uh, if we want to use a gun to go hunting to do that, so uh, I'm an advocate of our Second Amendment. I think it should, doesn't need to be changed. And uh, okay, I think she's told me to stop, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Asher? Yes, I like why I support the Constitution of the United States, um, and that's really a good question because the question is, do we want to break the Constitution? Or we want to follow it. I do believe we're following the Constitution. Um, I also believe in, in, in permit class, in permit some classes um, for guns. I think it's important that uh, anybody that buys a gun be educated on it. Uh, I learned that firsthand when both my wife and I took a concealment carry class and realized how little I really knew. Uh, and I thought it was a very good class just for safety. Uh, the word assault weapon is kind of an oxymoron. I mean, I think every weapon that shoots bullets is certainly uh, an assault weapon. And, and how fast they shoot or how big the bullet is determines obviously how dangerous they are. Every state has the right to uh, make their own restrictions on them. Um, I do want to share one thing about the United States. We do not rank in the top 100 countries in the world on deaths from guns uh, per capita. Uh, we're actually much lower than people think we are. Okay, next question we'll start with Mr. Green. Is there an average interest rate on payday loans that is 455%? What changes would you support? Well, first I would like to bring up that my first year on the board I worked with Alderman Pat Ertz to uh, put a limitation on their payday loan locations that could open up in Raytown. Um, that being said though, uh, I think that payday loans, uh, they do meet a market for some people. Uh, that being said, there are some many, many situations that we can all get count here where payday, you hear a story about a payday loan company and how they just completely ruin somebody's life. And the fact is, these people go to them out of desperation. And it's sad because you have somebody abusing somebody who's in a situation that they cannot be abused. Um, we need to take action on it. Uh, I, I, by no means am I willing to give a specific number or anything here because let's be honest here, I haven't looked at all the details and I haven't. I'm not down there in Jeff City and, uh, and looking at these situations, but further regulation does need to take place to make sure that we protect those who need protection the most. Thank you. Mr. Friesen? Payday loans. I think it's abominable for payday loans to be charging 450%. Oh, I guess I can. <laughs> so I will put something back there. Yes. Maybe your microphone. I think that would be good. I think that's a good idea. Okay. I think it's totally abominable that 
payday loan should be charging anybody 450% for just um, interest. For just a few days, a few weeks, a few months, it's terrible, the abuse, and I think they should really be, um, they need to be scaled back with regulations, strong regulations, like the banks. You know, so that's my opinion. It's gone too long, for too long. I've, I've got family members that have been abused by the system. And uh, yeah, it's got to stop. Thank you. Mr. Reed? Well, plain and simple, it's uh, usury. That's the only way you can describe it. Um, the question is, is, what do we do and how do we serve the citizens that rely on these or have to use these as a means of funding? Um, I've kind of looked at the issue a little bit. I know it's one that's been a hot topic in Jefferson City for the last couple of years. One of the things that I would like to see would be community banks. I think a community bank would be an open, honest, uh, alternative that would allow folks that have these issues or have the problems or need funding to be able to find uh, an equitable means of, uh, of money resources so that they can meet bills and the things, the, uh, the types of uh, uh, problems that arise and pop up from time to time. Thank you. Mr. Ed These are businesses that I personally dislike. Uh, I'm not sure it's government's place to regulate them. You know, they do a brisk business because there's a demand for the product, money. If, uh, you know, if the people that utilize these services could go to a bank and get a loan, they could do that, but they don't have, they don't have credit, or they don't have any credit at all, uh, or they've destroyed their credit, and that's why they end up using these. It's a, it's a terrible situation to get into. So I'm not sure there's really uh, an easy answer to that. Uh, I certainly, if there was legislation that came forward to possibly regulate that, I certainly wouldn't say I would oppose it necessarily, but I couldn't say I would uh, I would support it either. I really have to look at all the facts and information. Thank you. Mr. Asher? Payday loans obviously serve a purpose because of their people use them. I've never been to pay day long before. I don't know what the percent is. But you know the thought of whether or not you should regulate them opens up a real question. So they're charging 450%. Well, the question is, how much profit should any company make off of a product? For example, some drug companies make a thousand percent off of some of their drugs, even more than that. Uh, and that's the real question. It's really abuse of the consumer. I don't think I would separate payday loans all by themselves without looking at every company that overcharges consumers. It's, it's, a, it's a, I think, a very explosive question, but maybe it's one that we should consider in the future. Thank you. Mr. Farnes, payday loans? Great. Uh, you know, I'm really kicking myself. Uh, I was back in the military back in uh, seven. 75, 76, and uh, when I got paid, you get paid once a month, and uh, I was on country boy, so I never did spend my money, but I knew guys that would spend their money, and it'd be gone in two or three days. I would lend them $10, and I got 20 back. So, I should have had that back in the days, and I probably I wouldn't be sitting up with it. But uh, no, payday loan, I, I, I think it's a, it's a service out there for certain people. I just think it needs to be better reg regulated so that that group of people can do what they need also. And that's a business that someone needs. So that's what I think. Thank you. Ms. Creasing, we'll start with you. Um, would you support an increase in the minimum wage in Missouri? Yes, I would. I already start my people at $15 an hour, so I do walk the talk. Thank you. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you going to say something else? Well, you know, I know this is not very um, popular among uh, other small business, but um, but it's, we've got to do something about getting the money in motion in our state and getting people off of welfare. And, uh, and they all want to be productive people of society, you know. 
So um, um, we could regulate, we could control the different industries and think they might be crushed by it. But it's, we definitely have to talk about it. It needs to go up. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reedy, minimum wage. Well, one of the questions I have concerning the, the minimum wage is, is it a living wage? And I don't think that it is. It's seven and a quarter an hour. We have a lot of organizations out there right now that are fighting for $15 an hour as a, uh, a living wage. I don't really know if that's the right figure, whether that's too high, whether it's too low, but I do know seven and a quarter an hour and a family of four cannot live on that. Um, I would be for an increase in the minimum wage. I think what we need to do though as a state and as a community is to identify a living wage for the community and act on that first. Uh, once we reach that figure, um, I think the rising tide will lift all boats. More money in the economy helps all of us. Thank you. I don't believe wages should be dictated by government. I think that's an overreach by government to get into setting wages. Businesses should determine what wages they need to pay for their particular business, what they can afford to pay their employees. And if they don't pay their employees what they should, those employees are going to leave that business and go somewhere else. That's how, that's how it works. And uh, so I think, again, that's uh, regulation by government that is trying to regulate free enterprise and capitalism. And uh, something that uh, probably government should keep their nose out of. If people want to better themselves and increase their salaries, then get an education. Go get some training. Do the things you can that are available out there to help yourselves and not stay in that in those kind of jobs that may pay lower salaries. Thank you. You know, this really is a tough question because it goes back to affordable living and, you know, this, this is the world where we don't like the idea of welfare and food stamps, but the other side of the coin is you got to be able to pay young people who are living on their own a fair way so they can live. A good example of that is both my wife and I helped a young lady who was pregnant in high school, without a home, her only job was at McDonald's. Um, she didn't have a car, couldn't afford a car, couldn't afford a place to live. Um, now this was a very tough situation to make seven and a half dollars an hour try to uh, find a place to live, feed yourself, and, and have a baby. Uh, but this is the problem with many young people in the world trying to make it on their own. I, I don't know that uh, it, it's an easy way to Thing to solve, but it has to be addressed because there are plenty of people that do want to work, they do want to pay their own way, and they need a fair wage. Thank you, Mr. Farms. Could you repeat that question for me, please? Yes, would you support an increase in the minimum wage? Plain and simple, yes, I will. And uh, to, to elaborate on that some is that uh, I've read some reports where you have a CEO making $13 billion and paying his workers seven dollars an hour when gas was four dollars a tank, four dollars a, a gallon. And so, yes, I would, I would, I would uh, support an increase in minimum wage. Thank you, Mr. Green. What we have to look at with this question is several different variables. This isn't just a simple yes or no question. First of all, you have to look at the surrounding states to Missouri, especially with us being right within Kansas City. We're basically right next to three different states and. Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska within three hours. Um, let, I mean, let's just hypothetically look at that $15 number that was thrown out by Mr. Reilly here. Um, areas where you've seen a $15 wage implemented have seen unemployment spikes ever since that's happened. So $15 isn't going to be the number that we want here in the Midwest, especially when on the East Coast, you're seeing unemployment spikes. And when you see unemployment spikes, you're seeing more people supported by public dollars. And that's the last thing any of us want. So is the status quo good? No, it's not. But that doesn't mean that we go out of the frying pan and into the fire. Now, I'm not saying that we don't raise the minimum wage. I mean, possibly it might go up to, if we raise it to $10, we might see that benefit. But $15 is basically going to be a no-go because 
there where you see the resignation is having negative effects. But I mean, it raised, uh, excuse me, I raised the minimum wage uh, to a number that can come to you on a compromise. Yes, sure. May I rebut? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I suppose you can. Um, but
Sadly, that isn't really anything at the state level since Jackson County is in charge of that whole situation. So as much as I, tell you, I would advocate to hurry that up as quick as possible because, dang it, I want it right down the street because I want to be able to use it and I want to go to Royals games and I want to use it to travel from downtown Raytown to the, you know, to the stadiums. The fact is I'm happy to advocate for any state assistance that we can provide in order for that to happen, the sooner the better. That being said, that's in Jackson County's hands. So, you know, if they want state assistance, they can contact us. I'm more than happy to try to help out. Thank you, Ms. Cruzette. I'm very excited about the Rock Island. Um, finally, Union Pacific allowed the, the county to have full rights to it. That's why nothing's been done with it. And we've written about this in the paper. Um, they are going to be, um, uh, federal money has already come to this project, about $90 million, I think, the Cleaver got for us. Um, so it's not just going to be um, relying on the county, plus the fact that the KCATA is also partnering with the county to make this all happen. Now they are proposing, well, they're, they're um, opening up the trails, they're going to be cleaning up the 17 miles and opening it for trails in the spring of 2018, which is very exciting. So, uh, yeah, and it's also proven that where there's trails, the, econ the uh, economic benefits along those trails are uh, really accelerated and property values um, go up. Great, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Brent, let's first we'll start with you on this one. Uh, this question is about unions. Right to work laws allow employees to have benefits whether they join the union or not. What is your opinion? Is that fair? I believe every individual should have be able to make their own choice about whether they want to join a union or they don't want to join a union. I'm certainly not opposed to unions. My father was a union man uh, all of his life. He was a railroader. Um, and uh, I worked on a railroad, in fact, when I was 16 years old, between my junior and senior years in high school. Had I went back to the railroad, I would have had to have joined the union. I would not have had a choice. <clears throat> the union certainly benefited him in many ways. I saw that. I understood that. Uh, but I should have that decision myself. It should be my prerogative whether I want to join that union or not. It should not be the government dictating that to anyone. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Fisher? Well, I oppose the right to work laws. I oppose it because I was a member of the union myself. Here's my career dependent upon it. I was an NAA member. Uh, I saw my salary, my first contract was four hundred, was four thousand five hundred dollars. I watched how my salary changed. I also watched how the NAA made changes in the professionalism of teachers. It did more than just raise salaries. Um, and likewise, I, I believe it does for every trade. We forget that the people who train most of our skilled blue-collar workers are trained in union schools. Uh, they provide to the consumer the best possible skilled work that we get in this country. These are not people that come from uh, out of the country who uh, are not trained or not skilled. Okay? These are union members who are skilled at the very top of the profession. And when you want work done in your home, your business, in your community, you know, you really want to know that you get the very best, and I support that. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. I apologize. Could you read that question one more time? Sure. This question is about unions. Right to work laws allow employees to have benefits whether they join the union or not. What is your opinion, and is that fair? My opinion is that is fair. Uh, I support uh, the right to organize. Unionize. Uh, I've been, I've worked in the union, and I've worked uh, as a manager. And I, uh, while I was working as a union, I supported the union. And when I worked as a manager, I uh, negotiated contracts with the union. So there is a place for the union. I support them, and they work on safety. Sometimes management get too involved and forget about the safety aspect of the job. So, but yeah, I support the unions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Green? Um, first of all, uh, fun fact, or I should say funny fact, 
a lot of legislation that you end up seeing go through that uh, is right to work, or I, I should say that makes it to the House floor in a lot of different states, oftentimes doesn't include emergency departments and teachers unions because at that point they're, they know that it's not going to go through because it's going to fail. Uh, that being said, I oppose right to work uh, vehemently. Uh, labor rights are being stopped on all across the country and uh, kind of feeding off some of the, uh, the words of some other uh, speakers up here. You know, when it comes to unions, it's not like the government is forcing you to be a union or go work for a union employer. Government is, isn't dictating if you have to be in a union or not. Just like when you choose where to live or where to eat, you have choices. And if you don't want to work for a union business, then you can choose not to go work for a union business. If it, it should not be up to the government to determine the relations and the contracts between an employer and its union and its employees. That's not up to the government, in my opinion. So, yes, I am right. First of all, the um, right to um, form a union has been protected by the Na National Labor Relations Act of 1935. It's meant to protect both employees and employers. There are some companies that choose to be a union shop, and I got to experience that with KCPL. Even the clerical were a union. It was a very good relationship. Everybody knew the rules. and. Um, uh, management loved when the union got a raise because they got one too. So um, if you don't want to join the union, go, don't go working for somebody that has a union shop. My landlord has a Teamster shop, Stadium Sheet Metal, and uh, you know they work very well. And they get, you know, most of the government jobs, by the way, are usually union. So um, um, anyway, there's, but that's my feeling on it. I mean, I don't think we should this right to work stop that. Um, if it's a, and these people have the benefits of union bargaining and then not pay their dues is not right. If you don't want to be a part of the union, don't. Well, don't join it or don't work on that site. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Right to work is a blatant attempt to break unions and the bargaining agreements between your workers and business. I will never support any right to work legislation, period. Uh, I come from a union family. My wife just recently retired after 41 years as an EMT paramedic with Mass and Casey Fire. My dad was a railway mail clerk. I was a mail, post office mail handler, teamster, and communications worker of America member for many, many years in those jobs. If I'm not mistaken, currently in the state of Missouri, the legislation is if you are in a union shop, you do not have to become a member of the union, but you still get the rights and the benefits of the union's bargaining agreement in that organization. In a way, I don't believe that's fair. You're not paying the dues that the rest of your fellow employees are paying, but you are still getting the same benefits. Um, but that's the way the system is. Uh, but again, let's go back to what I said at the very beginning, I will never, ever support any right to work legislation. Thank you. Mr. Reed, we're going to start with you on this question. And that is, would you support pre-K public education and public schools for all four-year-olds? Absolutely. I think it has been shown through many studies over the years that the earlier you can get children into the education process, the better students and uh, citizens they become in the long run. Um, you know, some folks like to homeschool starting at that age. Again, you're giving your child an education. You're helping them with ABCs, one, two, threes, and everything that they need to succeed. Why not start at the public school level and make that opportunity available to all the parents? Thank you. Mr. Van Buster? Support pre-K public education for all students. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Uh, the Head Start program, uh, 
has been around, has been talked about. I'm going to tell you honestly, I was a high school teacher for 35 years. And uh, I'm going to, I really do not believe that I'm, I can answer that question in the best interest of my school district, even for the parents. Um, if I'm elected to this position, there'll be a lot of times I'm never going to know everything I need to know about every subject. And if I am elected, exactly what I'll do is go to the people who are best qualified to educate me on that subject to make good decisions. And they will be the people who, who actually provide those services. Um, it sounds good, but I'm just not going to arbitrarily say, oh yeah, I'm going to do that, without really talking over it with the people in elementary education. Thank you. Mr. Barnes? Yes. Um, I do believe in uh, pre k public education. I believe that. <coughs> and like uh, Ms. Asia said, there needs to be more dialogue on it. But I think uh, the earlier we can get uh, students into uh, education program, the better off it will be in the long run. Uh, one of my goals would be to, to have every kid that wants to go to preschool, to, to kindergarten, can go to school. Right now, we only can have so many. But I think if we could uh, get the funding right, every student in the 28th district that want to go to pre to k should be able to go there. Excuse me. Mr. Green? I think it's important for the option to be there. However, I don't think it should be mandatory. Um, I, I think that, honestly, Mr. Graham Buzzberg had a very valid point in that there is a lot of personal growth and there is a lot of men's education in, you know, enjoying your summers and, you know, being around your parents and learning those life skills. Um, they, you know, don't be wrong, there's immense education and personal growth in the classroom too, but, and I, you're going to have to forgive me because I don't remember the exact quote, but it was Mark Twain who once said that I learned, I think it was something about he learned more once in the summer than he did in all his years of school. Uh, you learn a lot of things outside of school, and I think it should be up to the parent because that's the parent's responsibility is to raise their children. And so, if a parent wants to enroll their kid in pre-K pre through K at four years old, I personally that's completely fine with me. If they do and they want them to have another year, again, that's fine with me. You're the parent; it's your decision. Thank you, Mr. Krusek. Yeah, what was the question again? Would you please repeat it, thanks. Um, would you support uh, children? Most definitely. In fact, the Raytown C2 School District is already looking at it. Um, you know, this is actually every these kids in some of these poorer neighborhoods need every chance they can get. And getting an early start like this, uh, early education has been proven to be so successful. Uh, C2 School District is looking at um, some of the um, uh, lower income neighborhoods like the West Ridge Elementary to start out. This is also going to take some of the burden of daycare off working families. And their kids are going to get a head start. Several years ago, the Missouri House overruled the voters about puppy mills. I believe in supporting the voters, what they want. That's basically it, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Reed. I remember that quite well. Uh, the, state, the voters of the state of Missouri voted to, uh, sus or, was to suspend operations, but to uh, curtail operations of puppy mills, and then the following House session, the House voted to suspend what the voters had asked for and go ahead and allow puppy mills to continue operating. Um, that was money, folks, plain and simple. That was money that was used to overturn a decision that us voters made. Um, that's part of the problem. If you remember when I spoke at the beginning about my uh, contention with ethics reform, 
That's a big part of it right there and the way money is used to bandy about Jefferson City and affect the outcome of legislation. Thank you. Mr. Van Buster, would you vote to overturn the vote of voters? Uh, you're talking about puppy mills specifically, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I guess it would, it, part of it, I'm not sure what you define as a puppy mill necessarily. You know, there are people who raise uh, animals and, and sell them certainly and I don't know. I guess when you think of that, you think about terrible conditions that the animals are in and I don't know that that's always the case. I would need more information about it. I really am not, I don't have enough information that I can really give you a definitive answer right now. I'm not familiar with when that happened. I don't remember it happening. But uh, I'll, whoever asked the question, I'll, I'll believe it that it happened. And, uh, and Mr. Wheeler said he, he remembered that thing, so I, I guess I guess it did. But um, I just I would have to have more information and, and know why they overturned that. Uh, I would think that would be uh, out of the ordinary to overturn the will of the voters if they went to a vote and they just made a decision uh, that just something doesn't sound right about that. I would have to have more information. Thank you. Mr. Fisher, would you overrule the voters? That's a great question. I mean, it was asked. I don't know who did that, but thank you. You know, this is a, an area that I have a strong record on already. I always stand behind my constituents. You know, if you overrule voters once you have put, as the legislature puts it up for a vote, and if they vote on it, you literally adulterate the democracy when you turn around and overturn what they did. And, and the bottom line is, as aldermen or legislatures, even in the U.S. Congress, you know, we need to have a closer relationship with the people who send us to wherever we may be, local, state, and, and national. We need to pay attention to what they want and how they feel. And oftentimes, legislators, even all of them, think they know more, they know best than what the voters do. And, and I remember one time in the city of Greytown, 72% said in a $20,000 survey that we did, we want a Clean Air Act. And I introduced that Clean Air Act and this board voted it down. People wanted it, we didn't listen. I'm against that. Thank you. Yes. Well, my job as your representative is to represent you and that's when issues come when you're not present. But when issues come before the voters, that means you are present and you get a chance to voice your opinion yourself. My job is to voice your opinion when you're not there. So if there's a, a, a ruling on the uh, voting, then it's not my duty to overturn that. So that's my opinion about that. Public referendum is extremely important to society. And God knows Raytown has been trying to fight for it multiple times over the last 20 some odd years through multiple charter attempts. But honestly, in my eyes, there's only two times that public consensus can or should be overruled. One would be concerning a, a matter that could be unconstitutional. The other would be something that destroys civil liberties of individuals. Um, those are the only times that public consensus should be overruled. This is a democracy. Public rule should be the case, except in the case where it creates tyranny in the majority, which in that case it destroys civil liberties of individuals. Thank you. Um, next question, Mr. Green, we'll start with you. The Senate Bill 572 lowers potential fines and eliminates possible jail time for nuisance and zoning code violations. Is that a bad bill or a good bill? Repeat that one more time for me. I would make sure I learned how everything. Sure. Uh, there's a Senate bill that lowers potential fines and eliminates possible jail time for nuisance and zoning code violations. Is that a good bill or a bad bill? As someone who has served on your board of order, I can tell you this is a horrible bill because it ruins, it basically uh, takes away a lot of the power that local municipalities can do in order to make sure your neighborhoods look good and to make sure that people actually take care of their homes and their properties. Um, I can't tell you how many properties that I've had to deal with personally, but I know the number is insurmountable because I can't remember how many that, uh, that it is. But 
That being said, there are many situations where you see, uh, especially, I mean, even here at home, you see slum wards, you see people that may that have properties that don't maintain them at all. And when bills like that go through, all it ends up doing is it takes power out of our hands where we cannot do anything to help you with it. Because the fact is, these things are affecting your property values. They're affecting your way of life. And the fact that you have to obey them and they don't because now this bill goes through and you want to take care of your property and they don't and it impacts you is just not just. Could you repeat that again? That was Senate Bill. Should 572 that lowers potential fines and eliminates possible jail time for nuisance and zoning code violations. And that uh, came out of the events at Ferguson because the folks of Ferguson were getting all kinds of um, um, unjust um, violations and you know, being taken advantage of. I have heard it is a big revenue stream for a lot of cities. The since that bill is um, uh, has been introduced, the um, Chamber of Commerce is worrying. Uh, the, Ch the city of Independence is looking at maybe losing seven hundred thousand dollars in that kind of revenue for little minor violations. So um, it, it may not be the best, but it's definitely trying to uh, take care of a. Uh, ugly situation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Well, that sounds to me like the state trying to usurp the uh, power of the local communities. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to agree with Josh on this one. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Thank you. I think it was bad legislation. It was knee-jerk legislation that was passed uh, that shouldn't have happened. Uh, I would not have favored it. I don't favor it. Thank you, Mr. Hitcher. You know, when bills like this surface, they surface because usually a city or cities are being abusive. A good example would be the Max Creek Law. Max Creek is down by the Ozarks, and they were getting 75% of their total city budget through traffic fines. That was pretty abusive. And so uh, the, the knee jerk response in, in, in Jefferson City was to take their charter away and make it no longer a city, their government. Uh, and again, that's, that wasn't a good thing either. In government, we always have to apply the rule of reason. And, and I guess for some people that's difficult to do. But if you have a court in a city that's being abusive, then you're almost asking for trouble. And to say that we're never going to supervise cities when they get abusive would be foolish too. Um, the bottom line is, good elected officials have to be responsible themselves. And it's a shame this day and age with the education that we have, that people go to Jefferson City to Washington and they do just the opposite. They themselves are not responsible. Thank you. Um, Mr. Barnes, we're going to wrap up in about four minutes of the question start with you. Uh, as a freshman rep, what can you work on at the GOP to bring about positive change to the state? Can you name one piece of legislation that you'd like to work on with the GOP? Is this to me? No, Mr. Barnes. Tom McDonald has done a good thing. He came back. 
He would uh, come back and let us know. He would come to the Democratic meeting and let us know what was going on in Jeff City. That's one of the things that I would be doing. I would even start uh, like a weekly newsletter to let people know back here in Jeff, back here in Raytown and the 28th district what is going on. As a freshman, uh, my job would be down there to learn what is going on so I can make a difference. Well, as I brought up uh, much earlier, I, I think it was the first question actually concerning gun, uh, gun control. Um, I personally, if you're going down there and you're elected as a Democrat, with Republicans holding the supermajority, sadly, unless you have something that appeals to the GOP base, you're not going to get anything done. It's just how it is. When you're in a super minority and you can't even stop them with a, with a filibuster and they can overrule your filibuster, then and you can't stop them with a veto, then you can't get much done. So you have to find some way to compromise and you have to think outside the box. And I keep bringing that up because when we look at the gun safety law that I brought up in the first question tonight, where essentially you provide a tax credit to anyone that purchases a gun safe in the state of Missouri, therefore it helps little kids make sure that they don't find their dad's 9mm in his sock drawer. It helps the situation. It makes sure that little kids can't get their hands on firearms that are used for self-defense. And that's something that you can work for Republicans on as a Democrat being elected. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, as the others stated, it uh, would be a real challenge getting down there in the supermajority, and hopefully we have a little turn of events in the general election. But one of my uh, bugaboos is to get Medicaid expansion. Um, we've got people that are, um, they don't make it, uh, enough to even handle the discounted insurance premiums under the Affordable Care Act, yet they make a little bit too much to uh, uh, be eligible for Medicaid. So we've got the working poor out there, and as uh, some folks know, Mission of Hope is out there uh, addressing the issue of the working poor who have no ha access to health care for their medical and dental needs. So how to get the GOP, I don't know. But there's a lot of money we're losing out in the state. Uh, there's federal money that, that could build on health care, um, uh, industry, the economy, and um, we're not taking the money, and who knows <laughs> how to get to them. I think probably the, the most effective thing that I could work on if I was elected. Right off the bat, working with both sides of the aisle, would be addressing the transportation issue in the state. Um, last I read, we ranked approximately 36th or 37th in the United States in our highways, bridges, roads, and that type of infrastructure. I think that's an issue that can be bridged bipartisanship on both sides of the aisle. Uh, that affects each and every one of us daily. It affects our children coming to and from school on the buses. It affects us when we go on vacation. It affects us when we drive to work. Uh, I think that's probably a fairly innocuous uh, program that we can tap on both sides and uh, garner the right amount of support, you know, working together. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ben, how would you work with the Democrats? Well, certainly as a freshman legislator, I would not expect to go down there and, uh, you know, make big, big waves. I'd be kidding myself if I thought I could do that. But uh, certainly, you know, someone talked about Tom and Don earlier. And, you know, I went down a number of times and visited with Tom uh, here from our city with issues we had. And uh, uh, we, had uh, we had a good report. And uh, I think I have a good report. With, with people on the other side of the aisle and would have. You know, the significant things that I would like to see changed, uh, probably to improve and maintain the safety and security of our, our district and our state, uh, to reduce government bureaucracy and uh, the waste of tax dollars, because it's significant. And uh, those are real needs. Economic growth in our state is important. So we talk about infrastructure. We, we have a lot of needs there, and uh, ways to fund those sometimes is difficult to find, but uh, that's something that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Mr. Fisher, how are you going to work the First of all, the Democratic Party is going to be a smaller army than 
Jefferson City, and we're going to have to be really good at what we do. We're going to have to be stronger than the past because the Republicans are going to bring back the same things that they did in the past. They want to get right to work law. They want underfund education. For me, I have a list of things that I really would like to get accomplished, and I think if I get the chance to go to Jefferson City, I can hit the ground with my feet running. One of the things, when I was chairman of the legislative committee, that was I was very passionate about, so really started over the death of one of my former swimmers who was blowing off his bicycle on 47th Street on the way home from work, Rob Osborne. What, we, and what I did with the family and through the legislative committee, we looked at the Missouri criminal codes because these two individuals were up for manslaughter, not first degree murder. We found that the Missouri criminal codes are very weak. We tried to lobby Jefferson City to change these codes because Missouri, like I said, is one of the weakest states in this country. That would be my first thing. And I would think that Republicans would honestly want to make our state safer. We have to hold them accountable. Thank you. We're going to wrap up now. Um, so thank you, candidates, and thank you, audience. And remember to vote August 2nd. Um, now we're going to start with um, Mr. Azure for the your final wrap up. Okay. You I'm know? sorry, can I keep doing that because I need to hear it. Okay. Well, I do have a list of things that I really would like to accomplish, and I'd like to cover everything, but I'm going to cover a few things that I think are really important, uh, not just to District 28, but to the people of the state. Um, one of the things that I think is really, really important is tax relief to the elderly with low incomes. These are people who have paid taxes all their life. They've paid them earnestly, but as inflation hits them and a fixed income, they want their savings to become depleted. They find it more difficult to pay their bills. And sometimes they go to buy their pharmaceutical products and they lay their money on the counter and they're gonna say, how many pills will this buy? Middle class, People are the forgotten people of this country, both in the local and the state and the national government. We need to address the needs of the middle class. Education is another thing that's really critical. We are causing families to mortgage their future, taking out loans to get the kids through college. That's wrong. We need, we need to make some changes in education. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Uh, I have two minutes and a minute left. I'm sorry, two minutes. Uh, I think it's absolutely necessary that we require the legislature to fully fund education. The Republicans have underfunded education for the past 12 years. We must change that also. Um, there's a list of other things. I also mentioned the, the criminal codes. I think the last one that is really critical, and there are many more, is I-70. I-70 is a crumbling road where our loved ones, our friends, are dying on almost daily. And it is getting worse by the day. It's going to become more expensive to fix. It must be addressed, and the Republicans have not done that. This is about safety, not just transportation. I think in the end, I'll go back to what I said before, we need to hold the Republicans accountable for the promises they made and the promises they've broken. If I get the opportunity to go to Jefferson City, I'll be a loud voice to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barnes. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for uh, having this, and the Great Town Chamber of Commerce for having this tonight. And thank you for showing up tonight to be interested in what's going on. My job as your state rep, I would assist the 28th district with concerns at the state government level. Uh, represent the district in order to solve the local concerns uh, at the state level. That would be my first priority, is to make sure that we get things corrected in the 28th <coughs> district, and I work for the 28th district. You know, our state and our neighborhood face significant challenges today. We face from maintaining road bridges, funding schools, to serving veterans and protecting public health. We need responsible legislators who are willing to work together across party lines to get work done. I am looking forward to working hard on the behalf of the citizens of the 28th, 28th District. What I would like to see is a, 
the senior citizen stay as independent as long as possible. I asked for a tax break uh, for 65 or, or older. Uh, I want to protect senior citizens against nursing home abuse, physical abuse, and financial crime. Uh, okay. uh, uh, make sure that uh, everyone has access to health care. I work on legislation that would uh, fund, that would have uh, expand Medicaid expansion. Uh, I will work to ensure that uh, uh, the veterans are being taken care of. Uh, let's say they resolve to provide job, housing, health, and education to assist military veterans and their families during active duty and after they have served our country honorably. Uh, unfunded mandates, unfunded formula, again, eager to uh, unfund, uh, uneducated youth. I will, I will be committed to every child receiving quality education. Don't be fooled this election. It is interesting that some of our communities, some of our uh, communities are now upset that the legislature is attacking our labor. This is nothing new. The Republican controlled legislature has been trying to pass uh, anti-labor laws for decades. On off the second, vote your own board for your state revenue. Thank you. Mr. Green? Again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, the Chamber, uh, well, and I guess City of Raytown for less than City Hall here. Um, first of all, I, I sincerely appreciate the, the honor of being up here in front of you all tonight. Um, I, I just want to tell you that, personally, when I look at the state right now, I, I see that we need energy and creativity, and that they are crucial to find viable solutions to problems. Some problems that we may not even know yet. Society, like technology, is, when you think about it, it's really always changing, it's always growing. There are problems that we need solutions for, and like I said, some of those problems, we don't know necessarily what they're gonna be yet, so we need somebody down there that's energetic and able to adapt to the situation at hand. Regardless of uh, who of each of you is going to vote for, first of all, I'd just actually like to thank all of you for coming out and participating in democracy, because it's very rare for people to do that anymore, so I, I sincerely appreciate it. Um, and I, this, I guess, I'm kind of definitely the city here on this one, but yeah, I would recommend if anybody wants to get more involved that you pick up an application and serve on a committee for the city or whichever city you live in, Independence, Kansas City, Raytown, because the more involved you are, the, the better that it is not only, I mean, just take it from me from personal experience, it's a fulfilling experience to serve and to help and to, to, to help people who have questions to solve constituency issues. Um, I, I guess, as a graduate from the south side of town here, it pains me when several of my classmates from high school move out of our community and out of our state. And one thing that our state really needs to focus on, uh, you know, and keep in mind, we have to focus on plenty of things. We have to focus on education. The obvious the Brownback method is failing. We have to focus on ethics reform, because Missouri is, and I'm sure Pat will tell you about Missouri is failing when it comes to ethics reform. But one thing we have to focus on is that we have to find solutions in our state and in our community to make sure and encourage new young home ownership and to encourage younger demographics to move back to Missouri, move back to Raytown, because when they move out and Raytown grows old and Missouri grows old, then there's no tax base to keep it going. And that's when you see communities decline. And so that's important. We have to make sure that we can keep encouraging young people to move to our state and our community. Well, we're finding out tax cuts for the special interests are not benefiting our working families as new jobs and wages. A drop in tax revenue is going to require budget cuts to services. We're already seeing it for Missouri's most vulnerable populations. And sadly, MoDOT is not going to get the needed funding to repair our transportation infrastructure. Building strong, educated, well-trained workforce is essential to attracting business investment and development in the area. When businesses come in, they look at who's here to work. Higher education is underfunded by our legislature, and now the students are having to pay for it with higher tuition rates. And it's time our legislature invested in its people because the people are the real assets of the state of Missouri. Folks who earn higher wages have more money in their pockets to help small business and develop and uh, benefit our state's um, uh, ability to um, infrastructure to support its infrastructure. 
Um, building a strong workforce means protecting the rights of women, LGBT, and minorities and removing barriers that keep them from reaching their potential as protected members of society. It means we must accept the federal aid offered to expand Medicaid to the working poor. Even their work is essential to the overall economy. <clears throat> Labor unions are just as necessary. The right to unionize, as I've already stated, is a protected right. My diverse work and personal experiences are an asset, I believe, that will enable me to make common sense decisions desperately needed in Jeff City and I hope that you will consider voting for me. I will work hard. I am a hard worker. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your, thank you for this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Levy. First off, I want to thank you all for coming. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, appreciate y'all being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and the Chamber for putting this together. Yes. I don't have a written text. I don't believe in it, it at least in this, this venue. Um, folks, I said at the beginning, I'm a lifelong resident of this community. I can remember Skaggs, I can remember Just Right, I can remember Ellen and Dandos and all the other little great businesses that were here when I was a kid growing up and my parents were taking me around Raytown. I can remember the Blue Ridge Mall being open air and I'm sure there's a few of you out here that can remember that too. We've got a great community here, fantastic community. That's why my wife and I have stayed here ever since we were born. Um, I own the house that I grew up in, still. I have family that lives in it. This community has been wonderful to all of our family. I did a telephone interview just uh, about a week or so ago with the uh, Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. They remarked to me how all of the candidates that they had talked to from this district were so passionate about Raytown and asked me why. I said, because it's a great community. You know, I talk to my neighbors over a four-foot fence. I don't hide behind an eight-foot privacy fence. I have issues that I want to tackle in Jefferson City. I mentioned some of them at the very beginning. Education for our students, ethics reform, Medicaid expansion is a wonderful uh, opportunity to take a look at too. Unfortunately, I think with Republican domination of the House and Senate in Jefferson City, that's going to be a tough way to go. But there's a lot of things that we can do for this community, a lot of things that I would like to do for this community in Jefferson City if given the opportunity. I'm a little guy. I don't make a whole ton of money, I work retail. One of my friends at work said to me, you know, Pat, down in Jefferson City, they don't pass laws, they don't work for things to help us little guys down there. When I go to Jefferson City, I will remember the little guys, because I'm one of them. I will work for us little guys. I hope that you have the opportunity to listen to all of us, what we have to say, and make an informed decision on how we stand. I hope that's me. Thank you, folks. Thank you. I believe in our constitutional rights, and I'll work hard to preserve them. The right to life, free speech, religious liberty, and our Second Amendment rights. By the way, I have read our state constitution, and we need to adhere to that as well. It's imperative that we maintain a strong military and provide adequate support for our veterans. We need to keep our promises to senior citizens. We must support and strengthen our police, not passing legislation that would undermine what they need to do to be effective at their jobs. With that, we need to maintain strong courts in our state and not attempt to weaken them by passing misguided, knee-jerk legislation. I strongly support our police, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel to ensure the safety and security of our citizens, which should be the primary focus of our government at all levels. It's imperative that we maintain strong, strong schools, but with local control. We need smaller government with fewer rules and regulations placed on businesses and citizens. This will promote economic growth in our state, helping us to compete with other states for new business and industry, thus helping to build stronger infrastructure. We need to maintain the sovereignty of our state, being cautious of strings attached to federal funding or assistance that sometimes does more harm to our citizens than it does good. Time will not permit me to go on, but I'll close with this. Government should not be a roadblock or hindrance to citizens at any age 
making sure that constitutional rights are protected for all of our citizens. I covet your support and your vote as I work with others in our state to move us forward and strengthen our state and this district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Vesper, and one of these candidates will be on the November ballot. The August 2nd ballot will have all of the Democrats, Mr. Schroeder, Mr. Barnes, Mr. Green, Mr. Krizek, and Mr. Reilly on it. So we hope you vote August 2nd. I, I will be on the August 2nd ballot as well. Oh, well, you are? I'm so sorry. I, didn't know you had I say I'm going to win that. <laughs> <laughs>